drone campaign coordinator here at Code Pink. Um, the reason I care about drones is because I'm from Islamabad, Pakistan, uh, born and raised until I came here to go to college. And drones have very much been a part of the Pakistani story and how we view the United States for over a decade now. Uh, I remember before I came to college, uh, there would be a drone strike on the front page of every newspaper. Um, but when I came here, nobody really knew what drones were and what they were doing, and that was something that always intrigued me uh, because they were causing uh, a lot of grief and despair on the ground. We're very lucky today to have another Pakistani with us. Uh, Shahzad is a documentary maker who's from Pakistan, and he's going to be making a documentary about drones and showing it to people over there. So this will be a part of it. I think it's important that people know that Americans also care. Um, and um, I guess what I want to say is it's... I guess we don't really talk about blowback enough, and something that we do is really simplify what blowback means. Um, nobody really understands how that works out, and somebody always says, well, have you been a victim of a drone strike? And I said, no, I've, I've never been near a drone strike. But what does happen is that even though I'm in the capital, if a drone strike hits a family and kills half of them and leaves the sons behind or the brothers, what do they have left to live for? And what do they know except for the machine that was in the sky that rained terror and destroyed everything that they know? And then they become galvanized to strap bombs on their chests and kill more people. This is a cycle that we're stuck in and that we keep on perpetuating. And that's something that we really need to understand is that we think we're stopping terror, but we're creating terror. Um, life in Pakistan, and I'm sure Shahzad can agree, has changed so much since life over here changed for you. The 9-11, um, the towers may have crashed and, and that caused a lot of terror here on the ground. And we all felt sadness for that moment. But our lives also changed forever after that, both for Muslims and Pakistanis and people of color on the ground in the United States that now can't, can't even go around a corner without being asked why they're there. Hey, we're going to lay down those killer drones down by the CIA, gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna pay for war no more, no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. CIA gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna pay for war no more, no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. Worker in Washington, D.C., thank you all for being here. Uh, basking in this uh, sun today. We're also basking in our privilege, the privilege of not living under the fear of the terrorism of uh, U.S. state-sponsored terrorism with these drones. The people of Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, so many other countries, the United States is now involved with militarily, are living under the fear of the drones. The drones can be launched every day. It takes a while for a U.S. military pilot to prepare for a mission, but the drones can be launched every day from locations all over the U.S. and even all over the world. What does that mean? To me, it means perpetual war. We're in perpetual war right now, inflicting fear upon the people all over this planet. And who are those people? They are the poorest of the poor. 
people in Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan. These drones are being launched against international law. Kill lists are being drawn up. Our government is being run by war criminals. And that is why we have to be here today. We have to be the voice for the victims, their families, in all of these places where the drones are flying and killing and maiming people, changing their lives forever. We have to be the witness today. I'd like to bring up now one of our friends in this witness today from the Answer Coalition, Eugene Purier. Well, thank you so much, Maliki, and, and I'm really glad to be here uh, with all of you old faces, new faces. I think this is one of the most important things we could be doing on this Saturday, despite the heat and despite everything else, because our government, uh, or maybe not our government, the government under which we live, is continuing to expand this criminal war on drones, which is killing and has killed thousands of people in almost every area of the world. And they reserve the right to do these drone strikes in every country to anyone they want. It has nothing, human rights, the sovereignty of nations, all those things have, ce have ceased to mean anything. Well, thanks all. Uh, if, as Maliki said, for the last uh, six months, I was in uh, quite good company with my brothers in Yankton, South Dakota, and as well as the uh, friendship and support of those of those good people, uh, I was conscious every minute of the love and support and solidarity and prayers of many people in this circle. And I, I'm deeply grateful for, for you all, as, as I am grateful for the uh, men who welcomed me there at Yankton. Now, when I was released, which was um, May 24th, I talked to someone from the local newspaper up there in Yankton right away, and he asked me if I wasn't dispirited by two things. One was the uh, president's address the day before, where he justified the drones. And the other is a poll that was taken a few weeks previous to that, which said that the majority of American people are supporting the drones. And I said about the president's speech, I had nothing to say about what the president said because he didn't really say anything. But the very fact that he was speaking, this was not on the president's agenda, that, that, you know, that in May of his second term he was going to be, be talking to the American people about drones. It was pressure from the people who made him address that as weakly as he did. And I was encouraged, too, as I was sitting my last day in prison. I was watching uh, television, I think, for the second time I was there. And uh, hearing our friend Medea bring some, bring some truth to, to, to this talk that was a... Uh, it was an infomercial, it was salesmanship, it was utterly absence of substance. And Medea brought substance into this discussion, into this debate, and, and that's what we're here for today. In the weeks before I went to prison, I, my action was in April of last year, uh, very much like what's happening here today, delivering an indictment to the uh, headquarters at Whiteman Air Force Base, one of the many places from which the Air Force is flying the drones. And uh, finally ended up in October being ordered to surrender myself to a federal prison on the 28th day of November. And in those last weeks before leading up to the election, felt kind of a desolation that the real issues facing the American people were not under discussion, were not on the table. And suddenly, in about a week before I turned myself in, I was uh, asked to speak all over the place, and the discussion just took off like a prairie fire as we got rid of the cobwebs of uh, distraction from the election and got to look around and see what a mess we're, we're making of the world. And this issue took off. And it was difficult for me to leave it to go to prison, but I, I was able to see it unfold. 
uh, in those in those next weeks and months. The poll that was taken by, I believe, Pew uh, in April, some 60% of Americans supporting the drones. Well, what's happened in the meantime? The story on the drone that we've been told is that this is a safe, nifty new technology. We can see the good guys from, tell the good guys from the bad guys. Our soldiers aren't gonna get hurt. We can wage a war from far away, very cheap. We have the support of our allies in the regions where they're being deployed. Uh, no unwanted, no unwanted casualties. Well, that is lies, and those lies have been unraveling in the meantime very, very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, John Brennan, just over a year ago, claiming no unintended casualties. A few months later, Obama said, well, maybe, but in the single digits. You know, now we know it's thousands, and it's probably many, many more that, that, that we don't know. And people are hearing about this. Also, many of us heard I saw Brandon Bryant on the Today Show, about as mainstream as media gets, speaking about the damage to his psyche and soul, a, a drone operator from Creech Air Force Base. And one thing that struck me, he said, talk about an attack that took place at night, and at night these drones use infrared. They don't see light, they see variations of temperature. And he shoots a missile, and on the screen, inches away from his face, he says, the guy was running forward, he's missing his leg. I watch this guy bleed out. I mean, the blood is hot. As the man died, his body grew cold and his thermal image changed to be the same color as the ground. So I can see every pixel if I just close my eyes. And he goes on to talk about the intimacy, he uses the word intimacy with his victim, that the F-16 pilots don't experience because they don't even see the plume of smoke from their bombs or their missiles. Uh, this was a survey that came out in April saying most people support the drone program was uh, countered last week uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Brian Davis of the Ohio Air National Guard based in Springfield, Ohio told the Dayton Daily News was talking about his mission with the Dayton Daily News and he lamented how the drone program is misunderstood. And he said, uh, my crew will be unhappy I'm having this interview. We are not popular among the American public. Every base, every other base has been protested. It doesn't make you feel warm inside. So Brandon Bryant used the word if, if Colonel Brian Davis doesn't feel warm inside over the protests in front of the drone bases, Brandon Bryant talked about the images that he saw of the people that he murdered and says that he is haunted by them. President Obama on the 23rd of May said the same thing. He said that he and his administration are haunted by the civilian deaths. Well, that's another lie because he's not haunted by those deaths. He is actively doing everything he can to deny that they're happening. Obama and his administration should be haunted. The CIA should be haunted. And we are here to do the haunting yeah. be because their own consciences will not do that. Right on. Unlike Brian Brandon's. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I've never been called director before, but it's a good one. Um, it's really hot, and I'm afraid that people are going to start passing out. So we're going to wake up, and we're going to do some chants. Um, 
So we're going to start off with, I'm sure everyone's familiar because we use this one a lot, which is when drones fly, children die, round the drones now. So I'm going to start off with that. All of that is true, so yell it. This, this is where it all happens, so let's be as loud as we can. When drones fly, children die, ground the drones now. When drones fly, children die, ground the drones now. Yes, sir. So I was just in Yemen with some other wonderful folks here, and there's other wonderful folks here that we were together in Pakistan. And uh, two things I want to mention. One is that the U.S. government pretends that the governments of Pakistan and Yemen are okay with the drone strikes. They say, oh, maybe for public consumption, they have to say they're against them, but they're really okay. In the case of Pakistan, there were elections. There's a new prime minister, Nawaz Sharif. Uh, one of the very first things he did was give a speech when he was elected, and in that speech, he said that he was totally against the U.S. drones. And what else did he do? He called in the U.S. Charge d'Affaires into his office and said, I want to be clear, the Pakistani government is against the U.S. drones. But the head of the government and the entire legislature have all voted for no drones, and any opinion poll that's been taken by opinion poll groups shows the majority of Pakistanis are against the drones. But look what's happening behind the scenes, and it's totally fascinating. When we were there just a week ago, not only did we get a chance to meet with drone victims, but we also got a chance to go to what's called the uh, National Dialogue Conference, and that is 575 people from all all over the country, representing every single political party, representing diverse groups of human rights activists, 30% of them are women, and they have divided into committees, and one of the committees deals with transitional justice and law. In that committee, they voted 90% to say that drone strikes would be totally illegal in Yemen, and that is now going out of committee to the entire National Dialogue Conference, which will become law. And it's pretty certain that that entire conference is going to vote to say drone strikes in Yemen are totally illegal and go against the morals and the values of the Yemeni people. So there you have it. You have the vast majority of people who are represented by this group, the, this conference, who are say something very different from what the president is saying. And you know what? The president's party is a big part of that dialogue group. The president's party is voting against the president. So when anybody says, ah, but the president of Yemen is in favor of drone strikes, you can say with all certainty that does not represent the Yemeni people. The Yemeni people, like the Pakistani people, think that it is horrendous. What one member of parliament said to me is, if you take somebody from Al-Qaeda, who we consider a criminal, and you kill them with a drone from the United States, you turn them into a martyr. You turn somebody who is a thug into a freedom fighter. You are doing just the opposite of what we want you to do. If these people were actually captured, and they told us in Yemen they think every single person who was killed by a drone could have been captured. If they were captured, tried, put into jail, people would forget about them. But you are turning them into martyrs and giving their cause justification. So let us know that we might be, uh, so far, still not a majority in the United States. But when when you look at where we are using these drones, and certainly when you look at polls that have done worldwide, we are absolutely the majority of people around the world who say this is disgusting, who say this is inhumane, who say this is illegal, and who say collectively, this is not the world we want to live in, nor the world we want to give to our children and our grandchildren. So I'm very proud to be with everyone today, and let us keep working with people around the world to ground the killer drones. Thank you.
I'm feeling very intimidated here, and I got a feel for how Obama uh, felt in the middle of that speech as he had to follow Medea Benjamin. <laughs> I see a lot of my old friends here, and I want to thank them, especially the Office of Security. You see these drones, these Hellfire missiles, they were first developed to shoot tanks, okay? And they're really accurate. And so uh, there are some Hellfire missiles just down where we can't see them. And these guys are standing right in the way, so that if, if we get hit, they get hit first. So I want to give them a hand. Thank you very much, Office of Security and uh, Fairfax Police. Now, let's talk a little bit about Hellfire drones. So people say, well, are they accurate? Well, I want to tell you that I talk to people who know about these things, and yeah, they are really accurate, okay? That's why I'm so glad to have these guys standing between us and them. Uh, well, what's the problem then? <laughs> okay, guys, uh, the problem is that the target information is incredibly inaccurate. I know how these target information, how can you see somebody from 24,000 feet up? Well, we got these great cameras, yeah, and we have these patterns and all that stuff. Give me a break. Give me a break. The target information is notoriously bad and it's not going to get any better. What happens very often is they give a disgruntled Pakistani a little homing device. So he puts it on his neighbor's house that he doesn't really like. His neighbor his neighbor never cuts the lawn, okay? So goes off to, to the restaurant, and when he comes back, there's no lawn and there's no neighbor. That's what happens. That's what happens with the targeting information. And uh, with this little legal-sized pad with, uh, let's say, 14 names on it, that's so the kill list, okay? That's the kill list. So, uh, so Mr. President, we have 14 this week. Uh, uh, all we need is just your initial on top there, and uh, that's all. So Obama looks at it and says, oh, oh, John, number three there. Didn't you tell me last week that he, he has three little children? Oh, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. President, but we've since seen him. The drones have detected him having lunch with a known militant who is a suspected militant who is married to the brother-in-law of another suspected militant who has a little homing advice on his house. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's a real suspected militant. So, the President, well, John, you know... <laughs> Uh, let's let's just do 13 this week, okay? He'll come back. We'll talk about this other guy with the three children next week. Okay, now I have to go. I have to go have lunch with uh, with my wife here now. And all of a sudden, out from behind one of the easy chairs comes Sasha, his daughter. Okay, and Sasha goes up to her dad and she says, "Daddy, I was just reading Martin Luther King Jr.'s." letter from the Birmingham City Jail. And I want to ask you, Daddy, uh, following what Dr. King said, why is it that black people and other white people are so mean to people that don't look like us? That's what Dr. King said. Why why are white people so mean to black people? But now you're you're the you're like a white people. You you got you got a nice real obviously. Why is it that black people and white people are so mean, so mean to other people. What does Obama say to that, folks? What does he say to that, okay? This is a racist problem. People that don't look like us, that wear funny hats, it's a racist problem, and I have to say that this president is a supreme disappointment to me because he should know better. No person it doesn't say no foreigner or no American or no citizen says no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well, where the heck is the due process here? And what does Obama say? What does John Brennan say? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we take care of that right here in the White House. We do the due, we do the, we do the due, due process right here in the White House. Well, give me a break. That's not the Constitution here. The other one I'll read is the Fourth Amendment because that should be mentioned given all the revelations that have been happening the last couple of weeks. This one says, the right to the people to be secure in their papers, in their effects, their houses, against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue except under probable cause. You guys know what probable cause is. 
the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized need to be described in the particulars, okay? So this president, the, his former president, his predecessor, was famous for saying uh, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. Well, President Obama has shredded this piece of paper and flushed it down the toilet, and we're not going to stand for that because we took a solemn oath to prevent that. We took a solemn oath not to let this happen. And when I'm encouraged by seeing all you around, especially Brian just out of prison, especially Cindy Sheehan who's been there, done that, uh, I just feel very honored to be asked to speak. And I hope we can just keep on keeping on because it really is up to us. Thank you, Ben. That started many new chapters in her life. Working for peace and justice, connecting the dots with the different issues that we're all facing right now in this country. She's just completed a bicycle ride across the United States, calling for peace and social justice. I'd like to bring up Cindy Sheehan. Here today, it's very important. Um, I find it interesting that Ray pulled out his constitution because yesterday my team and I on tour to peace, we tried to go to the court martial at Fort Meade and we got stopped at the gate because we have, you know, anti-war, pro-justice bumper stickers and plaques on our car, on the support van. And the guy said, the guy said, uh, take those off. First Amendment right to free speech and expression. You know what he said? He goes, ma'am, you can do it out there, pointing to the street, but in there is a federal installation. And I'm like, isn't the Constitution a federal document? Don't you swear an oath to protect and defend it? And But no, we got turned away because we refused to let them abrogate our constitutional rights. You know, we wanted to go support Bradley, but isn't Bradley in there? Didn't he do what he's doing to highlight the hypocrisy of this system? You know, so we have something up our sleeve, but we can't say it. <laughs> Stay tuned. So anyway, I was here, uh, I had a group called Peace of the Action in 2010 and we had a protest in front of the CIA against drones in January of 2010, right? Yep. And it was, uh, it was cold, a lot different temperature that day, it was in January, so um, I always complain whatever temperature it is, right? I'm never happy. So anyway, I just rode my bike from Potomac and I am sweating like a like a pig because I'm on a bike ride toward a piece across the country. And three days after Obama was elect was inaugurated, he had his first drone strike in Waziristan, killed 36 innocent people. I sent out something to my my email list saying Wow, three days in and he's already a war criminal, a presidential war criminal. And can we say that? Yes. Can we say if Bush was a war criminal, then Obama is a war criminal? Yes. Can we say that? Yes. Can we say we want George Bush and Dick Cheney in prison, but we want, we want Barack Obama and, and Brennan in prison too, yes. right? They have to, they use it 
against us, but we can't use it against them. And I'm afraid they are the enemies of the Constitution. Anybody who arrests us, anybody who prevents us from protesting or marching, they are enemies of the United States of America. And the people in other countries are not our enemies. Our enemies are here. Our enemies are at in Capitol Hill. Our enemies are at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And so we need to, um, I'm having a protest there on Wednesday. If anybody wants to come, we're gonna deliver a list of demands. And we're, is that, we're meeting at Arlington at 9 a.m. We're gonna ride across the Memorial Bridge and be in the, at the White House by 10. So come, because uh, earlier someone said we can't give up. It gets frustrating, doesn't it? Yes. It gets frustrating coming out day after day, month after month, year after year. Thank you for not paying for that Right, and, and she said thank you for not paying the wars because I don't pay for anything. I don't pay my taxes. I don't pay for these drones. I don't pay their salaries. I don't pay for the wars. But it gets frustrating. And you know what? They want us to give up. They want to keep making it harder and harder and harder for us to survive or to be protesters or to stand up to them. But like my three-year-old granddaughter said when a cop car pulled up, in front of our house. What are the stupid cops doing here? You know, we, and I'm gonna keep encouraging that behavior because just cause, you know, they want us to like cower in front of authority, but we're the authority. The people are the authority. We have the power, right? So anyway, before I explode, I'm gonna say thank you and I hope to see you Wednesday. Um, I have something here from the other side. It's easy to be silent about killer drone strikes. In the USA, they came for the Muslims. I'm not a reader of the Koran. Then they came for those who spoke out, including journalists. Why speak out? Then they came for the trade unionists. Who needs a union if you're experiencing economic bliss? Then they came for the whistleblowers. Why complain? Then they came for people of faith, but I'm an agnostic. Finally, they came for the activists, and by that time, there was no one left to speak out. Thanks for uh, Pastor Nemo for providing me a little insight. Let's explore his thoughts a little bit further. It is easy to be silent. It is easy not to notice. It is easy not to get involved. It is easy to theorize that you cannot fight the power. It is easy to go about your life. It is easy to ignore injustice. It is easy not to hear the cries of the pain and suffering. Why bother to take action? Those drone strikes are killing terrorists. The National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency are keeping us safe. There's no need for secrecy as it saves us from information overload. The, administra the administration, Congress, and the courts know better. Our elected officials are sure to do what is best for people. Trust them. Go shopping, buy duct tape, you can always vote. <laughs> I'm looking around for a supporter, and I'm not seeing anyone that's willing to follow me and buy duct tape, uh, go shopping, uh, instead, these are times that try men's and women's souls. I still, I still don't understand how Hollywood hasn't done a movie about Tom Paine. Common sense, read the book, it's a great, he's one of our great patriots. If he was around in 2013, he'd be doing the same thing we are doing as citizen activists. We wrote a letter to Director Brennan asking for a meeting. We're not just asking for a meeting, we're asking for a meeting to end the assassination program. 
If I told you in 2010 that the United States would assassinate four U.S. citizens without due process, would you have believed me? Yeah. yeah. It's astonishing. Let's just go over to his house. We'll consider that as well. As, as we know, some people have been there. We want to make this more official, so we're coming to his, to his place of employment. Yes, exactly. So we're encouraging everyone to join us. We're going over to the guard station. We're going to be uh, presenting a letter that many of you have signed. We've already mailed the letter, but we want to see if Brendan's here today. We have to have this meeting. There's an urgency to this. Recently, we just received some intelligence. There's a good possibility that there's a drone in the area. If they've killed four U.S. citizens already, wouldn't this be the perfect place for a drone strike? So be careful because we think one might be in the area, may be happening. So let's go over to the uh, guard station and try to get a little dialogue going. Yay. Thank you. victims of the killer drones that the CIA is operating. And because of this, we think our meeting with somebody in position authority is critical and vital right now. But here's the letter, and it's been signed by many people. And here is some other evidence of uh, victims of drones. They are children and uh, people of all ages, uh, different walks of life. Uh, they live in very poor countries, and we believe that it is wrong for our government to be victimizing these people, inflicting fear and, and terror. And that's why I ask once again, we do need a meeting. We do need a meeting now. We're very serious. I know you all knew, knew that we were coming here today because the tape was a crime scene tape. And it's very important that you have a crime scene tape because the use of these drones is a crime. It's a crime against humanity. Shame. And so uh, we, we ask you once again, please, can you call in and ask for someone to come out who is in a position of authority? We, we know that this government facility just like the Pentagon, operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we believe there is a person in there, at least one, who can come out and speak to us. There's nobody here today. Every, every police officer here today has taken an oath to uphold that constitution that Ray McGovern was showing us earlier. Every, every police officer has taken an oath to uphold the constitution. Four U.S. citizens have been killed by drone strikes. No due process at all. Right. Could we ask you to start arresting people inside the Central Intelligence Agency? Whether they're inside, whether they're at home, 
the real core war criminals are John Brennan, the president, the other officials of this administration who have planned this program of not, not really assassination, that almost sounds too clinical, of murder, of targeted murder, who have perverted the laws of this country illegally to make these things happen, who have done everything possible to criminalize those who have sought to speak out against the activities of this government. Anyone, uh, they, they, I forget exactly what they called it in the McClatchy story, the war on anyone in any any uh, government agency who tries to uh, release the abuses. They, they took us back after they arrested us and they brought us to a very large RV that was very nicely air conditioned. And they brought us inside, and after a while, they gave us water. After they waterboarded us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was Cindy Sheehan. Um, yes. We, we received a citation and release. Uh, we are all, most of us, we don't know everybody, but uh, we would like to go to court because that's another way we carry our message out. And um, we have done a, a lot of work interacting with uh, the CIA and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, so... Uh, some some of them might end up being uh, witnesses at this trial for us, so we're looking forward to something like that. And uh, putting the killer drones and those who control them on trial. Yeah. What what were you charged with? Um, what did you pay for? Um, entering and remaining on a federal blah 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 property. Can you uh, mail yours in? I can. Entering and remaining on an agency installation. It's 32 CFR 1903, I think. Insane. Protesting at the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> you guys are going to be in every database, in every intelligence service, in every world, in every okay. planet, and on and on and on. So, you don't need more? So how do we spell your last name? <laughs> I think there's a connection there. <laughs> o B U S C E W S K I, Max, and get it right. I want my name spelled properly in these terrorist databases. Okay, I'm fine. Max, Thank thanks so much for this action. Today. Great action. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll keep uh, in touch and we'll, we'll strategize and we'll do what needs to be done.